William Apis, the Pequot, um, a descendant of the, um, uh, the Pequot nation, uh, would beg to disagree. And Apis, uh, his identity as a Pequot is interesting um, because the Pequots were like sort of the first and, and most um, you know, devastated victims of European colonization. Uh, you know, the Pequot War in 1637, uh, you know, exterminated, uh, you know, through the, the, the um, uh, Massachusetts and Plymouth, these were separate colonies at that point, uh, really uh, exterminated uh, almost the entire nation of Pequots. Not quite, because there were survivors and, and uh, William Apis was descended from them. He's not talking about the Pequot War here. He's talking about uh, King Philip's War, which you watched a very short video about. Um, so you understand that in 1675, 76, there was really uh, you know, a quite devastating uh, colonial war that's often referred to as the deadliest war in American history. Don't know that that's really true, um, but the New England colony was nearly wiped out and the native inhabitants of uh, New England were, um, you know, closer to being wiped out. I mean, they, they um, lost the conflict ultimately um, with devastating consequences for them. Apis is talking about uh, the so-called King Philip's War in which the uh, leader of the uh, you know, combined Wapanoag, Nip Nipmuc, uh, and Narragansett forces, um, I, I don't know how, uh, you know, to what extent he could be described, the Wampanoag um, Metacom, better known as King Philip, could be described as a leader of like all of the forces or not. That's why Apis suggests here, but I'm not a military historian. Um, but anyway, he, um, uh, Philip or Metacom was the son of Massasoit. Uh, Massasoit was the sachem or headman who um, was uh, the leader of the, uh, the Wapanoags um, in their relationship with the so-called pilgrims. Um, so he's the uh, Native American, um, you know, sort of protagonist in the Thanksgiving story, the one who's supplying the venison um, you know, there, there were others, um, you know, especially um, Tisquantum, you know, better known as Squanto, um, you know, who are sort of, you know, play uh, more prominent roles in the of Plymouth Plantation. But Massasoit was the, was the sachem at that time. And so he's sort of credited with um, the Native American side in, in forming, um, you know, to some extent a benevolent relationship. But we see that, you know, if that's that generation's story, uh, you know, with the founding around 1620, might be sort of usable as, uh, you know, as a mutuality and, and, and welcoming. It turned very sour, um, you know, within a gen generation with that, um, with that war. But what Apis is doing in the first sections, like, you know, this is 78 paragraphs long, but through like the first 20-something um, paragraphs or something, he's starting out and he's really debunking the, um, you know, this myth of benevolent colonialism. And you can really like look, especially in those early paragraphs, you can see uh, how it's a pretty eviscerating rebuttal of the version of the story that, um, that we just saw in, uh, in John Quincy Adams' oration. You know, sort of, you think that was, they were kind hearted and fair right from, you know, right from the start. Um, nothing of the kind is where, is where Apos will go. So that's the section that I'm really interested in, in um, having you focus on. But I just want to say like, you know, 70, let's go right to the bottom, 72 paragraphs. Um, maybe that sounds like a lot. It's pretty small type. I don't think you're going to read this. Um, you know, I really don't think you're going to read the whole thing. And I don't blame you um, because like I read the whole thing and, um, you know, it's moving, but it's also tedious. Um, that might be familiar to you from some of the other texts from this course, but you don't have to. Uh, you know, one of the ways that we process secondary sources sometimes is to look at the assertions and not necessarily to look at every little bit of evidence because we know what it's doing there. It's a mechanical part. It's backing up the assertion. So you can get a strong idea without really sort of getting involved in all of the detail. And you can see how this essay works. And remember, we're approaching it as literary scholars and not historians. We're not necessarily interested in all of the content and the substantive detail. Um, and we're certainly, and we're not necessarily interested in, in you know, verifying sort of what's true or what's not. 
Um, but I do want you to think in terms of like the ethos, logos, pathos approach and, and you know, how this essay is working. Um, the, the Kairos, even though, um, and I'm getting that from you guys because I didn't really um, think about Kairos when I did the, um, the Douglas assignment. So he gave the speech on January 26. I haven't really looked that up. I don't know if there was something about that occasion. Um, it wasn't on December 22nd, like with the Douglas, um, you know, in the same sense that Douglas was on July 5th. Um, for the 4th of July holiday. Um, but still, there's something going on at this moment. And he talks a couple times about the president. Um, and here, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty far down. It comes up earlier as well. Even the president of the United States tells, states tells the Indians they cannot live among civilized people. And we want your lands and must have them and will have them. And he has said to them, we want your land for our use to speculate upon. It aids us in paying off our national debt and supporting us um, in Congress to drive you off. So he puts quotes around that. It's not an actual quote from the president at the time. And that president was Andrew Jackson. What he's talking about here is Indian removal. Um, and he's attributing this language to him as well. Again, it's not a direct quote, but it's kind of like a paraphrase. It's like, this is as if what Jackson is saying. Um, and, you know, so that's, it's important to think about that this is the context in which Apis is giving his um, his oration, uh, you know, which is that there's something political going on at the time, um, and there's an argument for removing uh, all of the native peoples uh, that live east of the Mississippi, all of those nations, um, moving them over to Indian territory west of the Mississippi and taking their land. So what Apis is, and so when he starts out in 1620 and then carries forward to um, you know, to the 1830s, he's looking at a continuous pattern of, uh, you know, of conflict and dispossession and removal that he says started in, um, in the 1620s. In terms of not necessarily reading the whole thing, uh, I just want to show you uh, a little tool that uh, I encourage you to use for this and other e-texts that you, that you look at. And we have one quiz question designed around this. So I just copied the URL from, uh, and you'll, you'll notice that the site that this text is posted on is Voices of Democracy, the U.S. Oratory Project. Be interested to see what else is there. But you know, if I don't expect you to do a close reading of the whole thing, you can do a distant reading. That means taking kind of like a broad overhead view of the of the text. This is a tool called Voyant. Um, see through your texts, um, and it's a distant re distant reading app. Um, I don't know if it's really an app platform. So I'm copying the URL into here. And I say, reveal. Excuse me, it's not drunk history, but I have a little drink. Okay. So it's Friday, Friday evening when I'm recording this video. My wife just brought this to me. So it's not like a habit in our household. I mean, for my wife to bring me a little beer. Um, we do that for each other. So here um, is a word cloud that's generated from the the corpus or the entire text of you know of William Apis's um, uh, eulogy for King Philip. A eulogy, by the way, means like a speech in which you know one is praised. So it's like um, I think I'm not really a Greek um, a classicist, but you means good, as in like eugenics or I can't Eugene the name, um, and logi means word. So it's like good words about King Philip. But as you know, it's a it's a form that's pronounced after somebody is dead, usually. Um, but you can see like which, um, by this word cloud, like which words come up most often and, uh, and also their degree of frequency, which is also listed in this part. Um, here you can do um, word searches. You can pinpoint a particular word. I was interested in the word poor. Quiz question about that as well. And you can see the actual instances in which it, com in which it comes up. And when I click on that, I can see the uh, the context um, and to pay the poor mother to success in murdering a poor Indian, poor Indians, poor Indians, poor Indians, poor missionaries, poor heathen, which is the same as poor Indians, poor Indians, poor Indian, poor Indians, um, and, and so on. So this is a great tool. It's you know great. Um, you, you're going to impress your other um, professors if you um, use it and refer to it in your essays, um, because uh, you can get an idea of the shape of the text and sort of what it's about. Um, and what it um, what its emphases are uh, by doing this kind of distant reading. So I just wanted to present that to you. Okay, 
so that's my little, uh, let me just go back and see if there's any other points I was dying to make about um, the eulogy and King Philip. Well, just to reiterate, uh, I'm not as interested in what he has to say about Philip because we didn't focus on that and we didn't focus on King Philip's war. Um, it's come up, it comes up a lot in other versions of 217 that, that I've taught where I, um, when I teach Mary Rowlandson's captivity narrative, which he refers to here, but it's not necessarily part of this course. What I am interested in is that parallel to Douglas and, and um, the way he, uh, you know, debunks the memory of uh, the the forefathers, and therefore, even though he's even though Thanksgiving didn't exist as a national holiday yet, he is uh, intervening in the uh, the memory of Thanksgiving. So I'm interested in this. Um, I think that there's a kind of a you know a correspondence between this kind of oratorical resistance from the early 19th century and that occupation of Alcatraz from the other um, the other video that I that I showed you. Um, which is also kind of like the Native Americans, you know, what to Thanksgiving is the Native Amer is what, excuse me, really, um, what to Native Americans is Thanksgiving um, is, uh, the, you know, the way I'm framing it, modeling after Douglas. Okay, that video is maybe a little longer than I was planning. Uh, sorry about that. I hope you have a great weekend, um, and I'm going to post something else about the essay. <laughs>